Good morning, everybody. Please welcome Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix, wherever he is. is he up there? <laughs> yeah, he's taking a picture. Okay, Catherine Waterston. Nobody's. Benicio del Toro? <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Maya Rudolph. Joanna Newsom. Michael K. Williams. Hong Chow. Jenna Malone. Owen Wilson. Sasha Petersi. And please welcome Martin Short. That's a good catch. <laughs> you can keep clapping. That's okay. <laughs> Let's open it right up. Uh, John, we, we'll open it right up for questions. Okay, raise your hand for questions. Um, this question is for Mr. Anderson. Um, how did it feel to go back into the uh, like a ensemble piece of filmmaking rather than concentrating on one or two characters, but having a, a whole slew of characters kind of running throughout the whole film? Felt great um, for the obvious reasons, getting to work with all these people. Um, the only frustrating thing is that it was only, for most people, it was only about two or three days, <coughs> which was a drag, because just when you got started and you got excited, uh, they leave on you and they go off to other movies. And I was stuck with him mostly. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's great, amazing. Um, kind of a dream come true, great feeling. Um, I, feel, I feel awful just to concentrate on one person because this is such an amazing stage full of people. And all of y'all, I'm much respect for the work that you've presented here, but this question is for Mr. Anderson. And I just, uh, with, the, with this cast of thousands that you have, what, at what point did you decide this was going to be a flat film rather than scope? I'm just, I'm intrigued for tech technical. talk. All right, I like it. Let's talk. <laughs> um, good question. I love nerd questions. I love it. Um, <laughs> I, I think I just got started shooting this way on the master, and I was thinking, did you ever see that movie, uh, Crazy People? It's boxy, but they're good. Vol they describe Volvos as they're boxy, but they're good. <laughs> I thought that boxy would be good for this movie. That was that was really that simple and like for good for the period, I suppose. Um, oh, I could talk that stuff all day long with you, but we shouldn't. We should. <laughs> I want to just ask um, if anyone wants to jump in and talk about the work of getting into the period. Um, any of the actors, if you have a comment to make on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Getting yourself into the world of 1971. Well, I guess for me it began with um, wardrobe and uh, us having a, I can take that. Okay. It was, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it was, you know, it wasn't a, you know, complicated process getting into that world of the 70s, but it was just sort of meeting with Paul and kind of, figuring out, um, honestly, what, what my character was going to be wearing and 
because I had some ideas uh, that that Paul was. Uh, you didn't you didn't go with my ideas, but but you. <laughs> I had one shirt that I really wanted to wear, and I guess it wasn't '70s enough. And then uh, the stuff. I, but I think it was when we landed on the overalls. Or no, you had, and, and you were sort of looking at some, um, some Dennis Wilson, uh, maybe that's what it was. It was a photograph of Dennis Wilson wearing some white overalls, uh, and then that was sort of, you know. And Zoot something. from the Muppets, too. <laughs> Zoot, <laughs> Zoot yeah. the saxophone player from the Muppets, he's got that, yeah. that hat and those glasses. That was and that. Our <laughs> touchstone, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's a good answer. Zoot from the Muppets is how you get into it. Hello, I'm uh, Dean Treadway, Movie Geeks United. Uh, Mr. Edson, great movie. Uh, I know that um, with There Will Be Blood, I know that you watched um, Sierra Madre a lot, I think. So I read that somewhere, and I can feel it in the movie. And I have a specific movie that I think you may have watched a little bit doing this before you did this. It reminds me a little bit of another Bogart movie, The Big Sleep. Sure. Were you, is that something that uh, affected you? And one more question, just one quick question. Mr. Short, I've been a fan since I was 13. Stand up at two o'clock in the morning to watch SCTV at Network 90. You shine like a diamond in this movie. I'm so happy to see you and to meet you. And I want to, I want to profess my love to you <laughs> and to the entire cast. My love. Finally. I can't follow that. Yeah, you're right. I saw The Big Sleep and it made me realize like I couldn't follow any of it. And, uh, but I just, I, and then it didn't matter because I just wanted to see what was going to happen next anyway. So yeah, that, that was a good model to go on. It did throw that stuff out the window. Uh, oh, hello. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Anderson. Um, one of the more interesting formal elements of this film I found was your use of the two shot uh, in conversation sequences, and particularly the way you have the camera push in on the actors as they're speaking and sort of the rhythm it creates. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, finding that rhythm for particular scenes. Uh, the scene between Mr. Phoenix and Mr. Wilson seems to go on for something like five minutes, and it pushes in so slowly you kind of don't even realize it's happening. Uh, and then when you reach the end of it, it's sort of a surprise. Um, that, that's kind of an incoherent question, but maybe you know no, what I'm No, no, it's a good question. I think it has to do with there's a lot of dialogue, and there's two really good actors that could do it all together. And it's any time you can do it without having to cut it together, it's so much better. It's, it's, um, believe it or not, it's an, actual, it's an easier day's work, because you know the one thing you're going to go after, and you go and do it. And, and Owen and, and Joaquin are capable enough to do it. And that was great. Yeah, that's it's really that simple. Hi, um, I really enjoyed the film. It's the the book has been described as pinch and light, which is sort of like saying for me like Dostoevsky light. I'm wondering how many of y'all read the book. <laughs> 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 Last night, jo right? Jo Joanna read it. <laughs> they all took the Evelyn Wood speed reading course. <laughs> I had my assistant read it to me. <laughs> <laughs> that counts. <laughs> from where I'm from. Um, hi. I think uh, you can actually see me. Uh, thank you so much. This is really a uh, great movie. And I want to ask Mr. Anderson, uh, it seems to me that your movies are very different from one another, but you are obsessed to some extent with this idea of masculinity and manhood. And I wonder if that's something you can talk about and also about your decision to frame this um, movie with a female voiceover. So we have the female narration. And I wonder uh, if that's something you can talk about. Thank you. Well, yeah, she's right here. Uh, Joanna, uh, I'd known a little bit, and I loved the way she talked. 
and I loved the way she looked, and it felt like uh, it was a supporting character in the book, like kind of Doc's best, best, best girlfriend, who not girlfriend but gal pal, uh, who always seemed to know more about uh, things than, and was always right about things. And so um, somewhere along the way, mm, probably just looking looking to try to uh, do something and have a, a good a good female voice come in. I came up with the idea of trying to do it and asked Joanna to do it. Um, and we just started doing it more and more and more. The more it worked, and I'm glad I asked her to do it. And I'm, I'm glad you picked up on it. Hope you like it. I think it works well. I think it was that if you're adapting a book that has so much. I think I, for a long time I was told that if you use voiceover, that's a no no. Like somebody ingrained that in my mind. And I think the premise was is that you, you have to have your characters do work f for you that you can't rely on a narrator to do it. So I kind of got paranoid that, that you, you shouldn't use a narrator, but I, all my favorite films use a narrator and, and narration, and I, I always got, was paranoid to do it um, until now, where there was so much good stuff that that character could say that was from the book that seemed helpful to the story and wouldn't uh, step on it or irritate it or subtract from what was going on, but hopefully add to it at its best. And that was the idea there. Um, and it was just great to get to work with Joanna. Um, Mr. Anderson, I was wondering how you approached the juxtaposition of tone in this film. There are some very funny moments against uh, set against these very dour scenes, very um, dour narration and music. I was wondering how you approached that. Um, dour? Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. I'll tell... Yeah, dour in a good way. I'll tell Johnny Greenwood what you said. John, dour in a good way. Um, <laughs> Honestly, I think w what you might be talking about is the, is the book. That's Thomas Pynchon. That's, 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 that's you know, what he does in his books is that you have um, the kind of, um, I don't want to say literary because that's a bad word, um, but be beautifully written and, and, and sort of profound and deeply felt stuff mixed in with just the best fart jokes and hoop jokes and that you can, silly songs and stuff that you can imagine. So it's just, we were doing an adaption of the book and we were trying to do that. And so that's, that's where that stuff comes from, is being, trying to be as faithful to the feeling of the book as, as possible. Thank you. For the cast, uh, you start with the voice of Thomas Pinchon, and then you start with the director's voice. Um, when your voice has to come into it, I'm interested in each of you a little bit about how you normally like to work and how this worked for you. Is there, was there rehearsal time? Did you improvise at all in contributing your own persona of the character to the film? Uh, a little, just a little bit about how each of you like to work and how you did work. Oh. I think, at least for Japonica, one of the special things um, about this the scene when we first see Martin and myself, um, what I really loved is that in the original <coughs> sides, it was written extremely different. And we worked on it, and we worked on it, and he wasn't afraid to have it take the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> but mainly what I loved about it is that there was one take in particular where all three of us did something completely different. And we didn't tell each other. It just, we put our characters into that place. And we collaborated and it turned into something beautiful. And I think that's in total what made this film come together. It's the chaos that we all brought that came down to something that was so simple that was beautiful. It's a testament to everything you did. Um, well, I, I think that for me, it's, it's if you're working with a great director, you feel very, very, very safe because you know that all decisions and all directions of this film will be made months later uh, in, in an editing room. And so 
you just feel completely loose. So I, I, what I loved is the, how many variations, and we'd go in the car, get out the car, go in the car, go out the car, try it again, try it again, <laughs> say anything. I'd maybe improvise an, uh, an approach to a line, and I'd say, Paul, should I do that again? Paul, should I do that again? Paul, uh, yeah, do it. And then we'd do it again. And it was just, so it was really trying to create as many elements and colors and hues that could help Paul later on when he was putting it together. And that's a great freeing up, I think, as an actor, particularly if you're working with someone great. <laughs> oh, and how did you get scarred? <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a very loose way of working, and um, but I think that um, you know I, I sometimes wouldn't necessarily know exactly what I was doing. I, I just sort of you know have to kind of rely on. Um, I guess what you're sort of saying that you know that you kind of feel comfortable or safe that you know these decisions will be made further down the road and you just try to do different stuff but I don't remember a lot of improvising but but we were sort of you know encouraged to kind of do anything um, and uh, yeah it was just a very kind of loose kind of chaotic you know, was that different from how you normally work, Paul, this movie? Or was this usually how you work? Because it, it felt, you know, like we keep saying, very loose and chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't, I didn't feel as, as, as loose and chaotic. I don't know. I mean, I feel like maybe it's all different parts of the structure and story and how, you know, there's different uh, tones, but... I feel like with Hope, we kind of just started with the words, you know, because they're so important in this film. And um, I guess that was a new thing for me, uh, really focusing on the words and um, the narrative and the story and just making sure, you know, before we sort of hit print, you know, that we have all of these, because, you know, he's such a beautiful writer, you know, that we have all of these little things that can kind of pull from such a giant source. And so I feel like, it was really nice. I've never had a, um, I've never been able to collaborate in, in a way with a director and just sit down with the words and just see what feels right. And then, you know, which was a very structured process, I think. And then getting to sort of sit, you know, across the table with Doc and become a wild animal, you know. Um, I mean, that's where the chaos comes from, but that chaos can only come from a grounded, you know, sort of logical base in a way because you have to know where you're going to be spinning from, you know? I mean, I think there was a point where <laughs> Joaquin and I just started clicking at each other for about <laughs> five minutes. It was pretty, uh, you know, incredible. And it just, in, you know, the logic becomes a chaos and the chaos becomes the logic. But that's, uh, you know, as you were saying, so lovely. It's just having the safety net beneath you, you know, to build from that. But... Well, um, it actually makes me feel good to hear you guys say that. I, I thought it was me. <laughs> I was like, I didn't think uh, Paul liked me. <laughs> um, it was a, uh, it was very loose, and it was, um, you know, I, I came into the project uh, a huge fan of, of both Joaquin and and Paul, and um, I think I hadn't slept for like forty eight hours. I came straight from another job to this one, and. Uh, you know, it was just, um, the process was, uh, it was different. It was like, you know, I never, you know, most of my credits, you know, uh, uh, are in television where, you know, they crack the whip and everything is just time, time, time. And then, you know, I get to this situation, it's like, no, let's sit down and talk about this. I'm like, <laughs> really? <laughs> Don't you just want me to just, you know, to perform? He's like, no, let's talk about this. and. Uh, and, and Joaquin was so generous and, and um, you know, I, I came in, um, you know, very uh, you know, intimidated, you know, um, to come to be invited to this table to, um, to play with such an amazing, immense talent. So I came in with a, a nervous energy and then, um, you know, then to be put in a situation that I, I was, was foreign to me, it was, um, I, I just thought you didn't like me. <laughs> you know, but, uh, um, you know, I I, uh, I definitely felt the same way. I knew that I knew 
the pro even although the process was new for me, I knew I, I was safe. I knew I was in good hands, and I knew that I, I had to trust. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that I, that I was given the opportunity to do that. I think Paul was just trying to make you feel paranoid. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I didn't uh, like you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh no, that makes me feel terrible. What did I do wrong? Um, I guess I would have to echo uh, everything that has been said. I, I came aboard this project uh, through a traditional audition. I didn't know Paul or anybody involved in the project prior. And um, I, I had actually read the book prior to meeting Paul, so he didn't actually have to do a lot of explaining as to what the story was. I think he you know, probably started to try to explain the story, but then I just butted in and was just telling him about all the passages and parts of the book that I really loved. Um, in terms of preparing for the character, I just um, watched a lot of movies from uh, like the 50s prior to, you know, the, the Summer of Love in 67. And then also um, I watched a documentary that was really helpful about the, the Manson period. So that, that helped to, to ground everything that was going on in the book and to get um, the historical background for it. And then on the actual uh, days of shooting, we just, um, I, don't, I, I don't think Paul went into it knowing exactly, exactly what he wanted because I think that he likes to experiment and uh, have the possibility of, of interesting things happening on the day of and I think that's what he wants to capture. Um, there wasn't a lot of, I feel like my particular character didn't lend herself to improvisation because I had sort of a responsibility to speak for the actual text. Um, not only when doing the narration, but even on screen, I felt sort of yoked by this sense that nothing should come out of my mouth that wasn't written in the book, or at least written in the script through you know, a decision that was made by the writer. Um, so that, I mean, I didn't have anything really to compare that to because this was my first uh, work in a movie, but I do think that that's probably somewhat atypical. Um, but I still experienced a sort of sense of the, um, for me it didn't feel like chaos, but certainly receptiveness to sort of change a plan based on and momentary instinct. Um, the first shot of the movie was um, not on any sides I got. Uh, there was no, I wasn't really told that that was gonna happen. I don't know if that was an improvised decision that Paul made or what, but it was sort of at the end of a day that I had um, already done my stuff for the day and was getting ready to go home. And there was a passage that I think was intended to just be voiceover. And, Paul was like, will you just sit on this park bench for a second, or park picnic table? And we tried, tried it there, and then he's like, try sitting on this lawn and just ask some random people who were juggling in the background, I think, to stay there. <laughs> uh, and, and did it, and like, I, I didn't have it memorized or anything. I just really quick attempted and messed up a couple times and then finally, hopefully, got it sort of right. And didn't think anything else of it. I was 99% sure that that would not be in the movie. And it was, and so I, I do think that, <laughs> like, there is a little bit of sense of floating on sort of an instinct or um, opportunity. I have my own. I brought my own. I just think that I just think hearing what everybody has to say, I feel like as a, as as more of a bystander watching Paul work on this movie. I think it depends on the scene. I think it depends on the characters. I think it depends on the actors, and I think. You know, a scene like, um, like in Rudy Blatnoid's office when you when you first see Marty um, is probably a lot looser than the scene when, you know, 
Owen and Joaquin are talking at the party, and it's this very long shot of, of, so, of a very detailed conversation. So, um, which is what, you know, I, I love so much about Paul's work, which is that it's, it's anything and everything, and yet it's always his. Um, and, you know, it allows a scene like in Dr. Blatnoid's office to be crazy, um, but then something else to be dark and mysterious. And I don't know, I got to improvise a little bit about an afro or something like that. <laughs> that was very good. Um, I, I remember jumping in right into a three-page monologue. And um, it was, uh, I think someone said that in order to learn your lines, you need to repeat them 300 times. So by the end of the scene, we, we <laughs> knew our lines. <laughs> um, but um, it, it, he, would take a, he would take a scene that takes place on a, on a table and he'll move it into a car. And, and you, you, it was like dancing in a way. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I think uh, working with Joaquin and my scenes with Josh Brolin too were were a lot of fun. It was a lot of laughing, and Paul was laughing at us. And so that was fun. Um, working with Paul was the best creative experience I've ever had. I don't really know exactly how he does what he does or how he, what he wants or what he, why he creates the spirit he creates on set, but. Um, but it, it's really conducive to, um, you know, make to good work. I, um, a, a great experience. Um, I remember w the first day I visited set before I started shooting, I think, uh, there was a scene between uh, Josh and Joaquin, and they were, they were dancing in front of the car, you know, um, and Paul was standing next to the DP watching them as, he, as the DP was pushing him <laughs> like this, like so excited to see what they were gonna do next. And it, it, was so, it, it was so comforting to me to know I was going into a working environment where the director was very interested in what, what the actors could bring. That's the feeling I think that is consistent um, whether you're doing something really harebrained and insane or improvisational or really following the script, but there's this feeling you're held by that the whole time. Totally. Quite lovely. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, we got time for one final question. Uh, yeah, this is the only movie I believe screening in 35 millimeter. I was wondering if you'd like to talk about that. Yeah, um, uh, I feel like a fraud because you just didn't see that here. It's playing tonight at the Alice Tully Hall, but luckily um, we're able to still keep that alive and keep that going. Um, it's just sort of something I started doing back at the beginning, so it's just sort of the only way I know how to do it and just been able to keep that up and have a great, nice print to show tonight. Um, and 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 all the nerve and all the nerves that accompany that everything could break easily and and uh, and that's kind of adds to the thrill of it all and it looks beautiful. Um, I yeah, just trying to keep it alive a little bit longer, or you know, not to phase anything out. Try to keep there's room for both things. So and it's just great that the projectors are still there. They're well kept up. It looks beautiful, great, and that's. That should just that should just be how it is. Um, nothing should go away. Um, so that's it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Paul.